Hello, I'm Cormar. Welcome to the Gourmet Vegetarian Cooking Video Encyclopedia. This edition, we're going to show you how to prepare all these delightful breads and savouries, such as basic unleavened whole wheat breads, chapatis, deep fried puffed breads, puddies, and flaky pan fried bread stuffed with green peas, parattas. So let's begin. Chapatis, basic unleavened whole wheat breads, are probably the world's most popular unleavened bread. They're so easy to make, they're nutritious, and they're delicious. And I'm going to show you how to make them. The first thing you're going to have to know is what sort of flour to use. Uh, for a start, you need whole wheat flour, but not ordinary whole wheat flour. I suggest you try to use utter flour. Utter is not a brand. Utter is a variety of flour, whole wheat flour, which is uh, imported from India. What it is, it's the whole wheat grains that have been finely milled into a very, very fine flour, which specifically lends itself to this sort of bread making. In fact, utter flour is also known as chapati flour. You go to any Indian specialty shop and you should be able to purchase it. You can see that uh, chapati flour is very fine in its quality. If you can't get a whole of uh, utter flour, you can use any sort of whole wheat flour and you should sift it, however, very finely. So, for that purpose, you require a little flour sifter. Now, there's also a few things you should know about equipment. Uh, there's not really complicated equipment involved with making chapatis, but you do need, for a start, a rolling pin. Now, this particular rolling pin is an Indian-style rolling pin, especially for making chapatis and other Indian breads. Uh, these are very easy to obtain also in any Indian specialty shop. Otherwise, you can use the traditional rolling pin, either a marble rolling pin or a heavy wooden one. But I would suggest, if you can't get a hold of the Indian style, try to use a thin, traditional rolling pin. You do need a nice, smooth rolling board, and you also need some sort of hot plate. I'm going to use today uh, a conventional cast iron griddle. You can, however, if you're into making chapatis in a big way, obtain one of these. They're called tava, and they're a specifically made type of hot plate for chapatis. They're curved and they're very light and they're used for making one chapati at a time. But if you can't get a hold of one of these, any sort of cast iron hot plate will be fine. As far as your cooking medium is concerned, you just need a stove top with two available burners. One to put the hot plate on and one to roast the chapati over an open flame. If you have an electric stove, however, you might say, how is it possible? You can duplicate this by putting a grill across the electric ring so the chapati heats up very close to the ring but not touching it, and that will achieve the same result. So we're going to start by making our chapati dough. So as far as your flour is concerned, if you're using atta, you don't really need to sift it because if you do, you'll find, practically speaking, there's nothing left in the sifter because it, it's so finely milled already. If you're going to use any other sort of wholemeal flour, you definitely have to sift it, take out all the wheat germ and the bran. Now, for our recipe today, I'm going to show you how to make enough dough for about six or eight large chapatis, or about 10 or 12 medium to small ones. So we've got here one and three quarter cups of utter flour, into which we're going to put one scant teaspoon of salt. If you don't like salt, you can miss it out, although I find chapatis need a little salt. And just water. We're going to add between three quarters and one cup of cold water. Now, that's all that's going in. Just simply flour, salt, and water. Now, one thing to know about making chapatis is just add a little water at a time so you don't go overboard. And you should pour it in and mix it around like this. You should always have extra flour on hand just in case you make your dough too wet. And also, you're going to need flour to roll them in. Sometimes you're going to need more or less water than what the recipe calls for for making chapatis because sometimes when flour sits, it soaks up water from the atmosphere. So the amount of water, specifically for this recipe, can be taken as a guide. As you can see here, the first step is to gather all the ingredients together, like this, into one lump. And that's the basic unneeded dough. So as far as kneading is concerned, if you're familiar with bread making, you should be familiar with kneading. Kneading simply means to make a smooth, pliable dough by applying the pressure from your palms and the heel of your 
pan on a lump of dough for about five or ten minutes in order to make it soft and smooth for rolling. For that you need a smooth surface and a bit of pressure from your hands. This is where the heavy weight has its advantage. So that's been about 10 minutes. It's a real workout. The dough is very soft and pliable, but I'm not going to cook my chapatis out of this dough straight away. What I like to do is to put my dough aside for about an hour or more in order to proof the dough a little, and in, in other words, allow it to uh, mature somewhat. It makes much better chapatis. So over here, we've got a batch of dough that's been sitting for about an hour and a half, two hours. What happens, you find sometimes the dough becomes a little more moist when it sits around, but that's okay. These are going to be rolled in flour. So after the dough's been sitting, once again, give it another few seconds of kneading. Now, you should sprinkle some flour on your rolling board, like so. Pull off a lump of dough, enough for more than one chapati, and roll it into a little snake, like so. And then cut it into pieces, like so. All right, take those off. Take one of those pieces and roll it between the palms and press very hard between your palms till you get this spiral arrangement. Place this down on a floured board so that that spiral there is on top. Flour your rolling pin. Gently apply pressure from the rolling pin until you get an elongated shape like that. You might need to flour your rolling pin as you go along just to make sure it doesn't stick to the dough. Now turn that over 45 degrees and the other way over. Sprinkle some more flour on there and roll it out again. Notice here how we're getting more towards that circular shape that we're looking for. Often you'll find that your first one or two chapatis aren't round. That just seems to be how it is. But generally as you get that motion going, they, they tend to regain their proper shape. So there we have a chapati, pretty round. It's very thin. It's evenly rolled all around. And now we have to transfer it to the hot plate. So I'll show you how that's done. You very carefully pick up the chapati with two hands and take it over very quickly and just drop it in one go on top of the hot plate. Now at this stage, don't touch your chapati for the first few seconds until you see some bubbles appear. There's no bubbles appearing yet. Chapatis are rich in fiber, vitamins B and E, protein, iron, unsaturated fats and carbohydrates. And they're also delicious. Now at this point in time, you shouldn't touch it at all with anything until you start to see little bubbles appearing. In the meantime, you can have your naked flame ready. Now, if you look closely there, you'll see there's little bubbles appearing. These little bubbles means that the chapati is actually starting to cook. This will take between 30 seconds and 45 seconds for those first bubbles to appear. See those bubbles? Now we're going to turn it over, cook it on the other side. Now on the other side, the chapati starts to puff up even more. See these brown spots are perfectly all right. They should be there. Now as this chapati starts to puff up, we're going to put our spatula down, pick up our tongs. And when it starts to lift itself up like this, you notice all these little places where it's lifting off from the pan. It's just about ready to go. So let's pop it on our flame, shall we? And carefully Transfer your chapati onto the flame. There we are, one beautiful chapati, puffed up like anything. Let's turn it over. Mmm, beautiful. 
lift it off the flame, transfer it onto a dish, and if you like, smear it with some melted butter. Most delicious combination, hot chapatis with butter. Well, there might only be one way to cook a chapati, but there's many ways to eat a chapati. You can eat it straight as it is, off the hot plate with lots of butter, or you can spread your favourite jam on top, or more traditionally, you can eat it with a full meal of vegetables and dals and things like that. Generally how it's done, some of the chapati is torn off, it's either dipped in the dal or it's used to scoop up some of the succulent vegetable. Deep fried breads or puris are the most popular breads in India and they're very simple to make. I'm going to show you how to make these delightful little things right now. Here we've got two types of flour. Atta flour that we use to make the chapatis and unbleached plain flour. I'm going to combine these together in our bowl. I'm going to add to that some salt, half a teaspoon, two tablespoons of butter and I'm going to rub the butter into the flour to produce a coarse meal-like texture. Now you don't have to use this combination of flour but I've found this makes a puri dough which is light and at the same time crispy and tasty. You can use straight wholemeal if you like, or you can use plain flour or whatever combination you choose. I found, however, this makes a very delightful textured puri. Now see how now the flour here is resembling a coarse oatmeal. This is the texture you're looking for at this stage. So unlike chapatis, puris are deep fried and they also have butter or ghee inside the dough, so they're substantially richer than chapatis and they're delicious served with vegetables. That's always the combination that I enjoy the most. Hot puris with a hot vegetable dish and you tear off some of the puri and you scoop up the vegetable with it. And They're very simple to make once you get the routine down. So when the flour and butter resembles this consistency, make a little well in the bottom of your bowl. We need about approximately half a cup of water. But like I mentioned for the chapatis, it does vary according to the flour. So add a little at a time. And I've suggested that you use warm water. I've found this makes a smoother puri dough. So let's see how this is holding together. Now it needs a little more water. Now we bring it all together in one lump. Now you have to knead your dough for about five minutes. Now I have a batch of dough here which is already made, already kneaded, and I've allowed it to sit for half an hour. Let me show you. Notice how silky smooth it is. Now the next stage, you have to pinch off little walnut-sized balls of dough and roll them in the same way that you did the chapatis. In other words, first of all, squeezing that ball of dough between your palms to really get that circular effect, like so. Place your ball of dough in the middle of the board, like so. Flatten it out to a little disc. Take your rolling pin. Roll out a oval-shaped piece of dough. Turn it 90 degrees and over to the other side. 
and repeat. Now you get a, a three-quarter size puri. This is still a little thick, so turn it over and another 90 degrees. Now you see your puri is getting bigger. Now one more time should do it. Should be quite thin and evenly rolled. Like so. You have a very nice, smooth, even, thin disc. So our gear here is about 370, 380 degrees. Notice how there's some smoke coming out of the top. That's the desired temperature it should be. Make sure you have a, a colander on hand and you have something to take the puris out of the gear with, like this. These are ideal. So now just take the puri, gently lower it into the ghee, pushing it underneath with your little spoon. Notice how it rises up and puffs into a ball. If you like, you can splash a little ghee on top, like so. Now turn it over gently. Round it on the other side. So it's cooked on both sides, you notice. So there they are, a beautiful batch of hot puffed puris. Flaky pan fried breads stuffed with peas or matar paratas are a very substantial filling savoury dish which are traditionally served with yogurt or homemade chutney. This recipe is divided into two, the pastry and the filling. So I'll start by showing you here the ingredients for our filling. This is peas. We've got one and a half, two cups of peas with one medium chopped tomato. We've got half a teaspoon of asphatida half a teaspoon of chili powder, one half of a teaspoon of ginger, a teaspoon of gram masal, one teaspoon of salt, two tablespoons of fresh minced coriander, one tablespoon of ghee, and one tablespoon of fresh lemon juice. Now the first thing we're going to do is to mix all our ingredients together in this pan along with the spices and ghee and make our filling. So for a start, let's add our ghee. Let's fry up some of our spices. We've got some asphatida and ginger. Let's saute these for a minute or two. Well, actually, we only need to saute these until the ginger starts frying nicely. Now let's add our tomatoes. And our coriander. Salt, chili powder, gram masal, and peas. Now let's saute this for a minute or so. <coughs> Quite a rich aroma coming from the spices there. Good for the sinuses. 
Now I'm going to turn this flame down to medium and I'm going to allow these vegetables to saute until the peas are soft and the tomatoes are broken down and while it's cooking down I'm going to show you how to make your pastry. So over here we have our utter flour. This is the basis for our pastry. In fact, this pastry is very similar to chapati dough, except that we're going to add some butter. So let's add about one and a half teaspoons of salt. We have two tablespoons of butter or ghee. Now let's rub in our ingredients carefully. We want our pastry to resemble a coarse meal-like consistency here like so. Now we're going to add some water. I suggest you use warm water for this pastry. And you just have to add a little at a time until you have a soft, smooth dough. I'm going to add a morsel more water. Gather it all into one ball. Place it on our cutting board here, which is doubling as a rolling board. Add a little flour if necessary. And knead it into a soft, pliable dough for about five minutes. Well it's been about five minutes now. I'm working up a sweat here. This dough is looking really good. Nice and soft and pliable. Let's have a look at our filling. This is also looking done. Notice how the tomatoes have cooked right down to a paste. The peas are still whole but not for long. Let's bring in our masher mash them to a pulp. Let's add our lemon juice at this stage. You see we have to spread this filling on these paratas so it has to be smooth enough that we can do that. Notice how all those peas are completely mashed. Let's transfer our parata filling onto a tray. In other words, we want our filling here to cool down nicely so that by the time we're ready to stuff our paratas, this is cold because we can't use it while it's hot. I don't want to waste any of this, so I'm going to use our spatula and take every last morsel of filling from our pan here. Like so. Now let's spread this over our tray so it cools down all the more quickly. There. Now let's return to our pastry. I've had this pastry kneading for about five minutes and it's very soft. So what I want to do now is to roll it into one long snake. Like so. It should be even all the way along. Let's cut it into 16 even sized pieces. like so. So let's take off all our little patties here except for one. Let's get a little flour, sprinkle it on the board like so. Let's roll our patty into a ball. Flatten it out, put a bit of flour on our cutting board if necessary. Let's roll out one half of our parata here into a six inch disc, like so. Let's put another board here so we can store these on. Let's take another disc, take another lump of dough and dredge in a little flour, a little flour on a pin if necessary 
and repeat that process. In other words, roll out another six inch disc, which is the second half of our parata, like so. Now, let's place a spoonful of filling, place it in the middle of our disc, and let's carefully, with the aid of a spatula, spread it over, leaving a border of about half an inch. This is all the filling you need. Now let's add a little water around the outside rim and spread it all around. This enables you to adhere the second disc of flour on the top. Take your second disc, place it on top like so, and go around with your thumb and seal it like this. If necessary, lift it off a little and seal it some more. Now let's take a heavy pan and let's take a little ghee onto our pan, spread it around with a little brush like so and ever so carefully lift your parata onto your hot plate, like so. Now take a little ghee, drizzle it around like so, around the outside of the parata for about half a minute. Brush a little ghee on top, like so. And then with your spatula, very carefully turn it over. See how it's looking beautifully browned and marbled like this? Now continue for about altogether perhaps three or four minutes, turning over all the while and brushing with ghee until it has this beautiful marbled appearance on both sides. This is a very beautiful dish as I was mentioning, served with chutney and yogurt. Wonderful for breakfast. To enable your parata to cook evenly all around, press it down with a spatula like this, because as the parata cooks, it lifts off the hot plate somewhat. There, I think that's done. Let's place it on our dish. And there it is, a beautiful golden crusty brown stuffed whole wheat parata with green peas. So there we have it, some of the best bread and savoury recipes from the Indian vegetarian cuisine. Happy eating.